All right. Uh, I enjoy, I like that enthusiasm. Um, I, um, I work in the tech industry in Armenia, although I'm originally from Montreal, Canada, and I also uh, am a columnist and Armenia correspondent for uh, Armenian Weekly. So if you're not subscribed to that publication, you should do that right now. I will be publishing tonight as I do on every Wednesday. Uh, but of course, uh, I just uh, read the sign on uh, today's uh, event on Repat Armenia's Facebook page, and it says, and it's in small print, I must admit, but it says Haik Kazarian. So I should stop talking about myself and instead introduce Haik. Uh, I went to university with Haik. We went to University of Ottawa, class of, was it 2008 or nine? 14, know, uh, you know, since this war started, of course, uh, time has been flying. Uh, but uh, Hayek at the time was uh, studying uh, entrepreneurship at University of Ottawa's business school, and he had started his first business, uh, which was called Students for Seniors, which I believe still exists. Uh, I'll let Hayek explain what that does, but since I moved to Armenia in 2011, he also uh, moved here from Montreal. Of course, Hike is born in Armenia. When did you move here, Hike? Uh, May 2018, in the six days after the revolution. That's right. He remembers that. Uh, of course, I remember uh, the day in which Hike uh, organized a ceremony where he ripped up his return ticket to Montreal because on that day, Hayek decided that he was permanently moving back to Armenia. And since he's been here, uh, he's been involved in quite a lot of very impressive entrepreneurial projects. So congratulations, congratulations, University of Ottawa. Finally, somebody who did something with one of your degrees. Uh, I hope my you know dean isn't watching this. So that said, Hayek, uh, let's just quickly talk about uh, one of your first ventures since you've been in Armenia, the Abaka uh, recycling program. Sure. Uh, you know, oh, just to quickly. get us. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, basically, get the ball rolling. Yeah, we, we started a, uh, a recycling logistics service. So, those individuals and uh, businesses who feel responsible for their waste. Uh, are able to uh, basically get a service where we come and pick up their uh, recyclable waste from their home or business and take it to get recycled. Um, it's a paid service just because the recycling, like the, the actual waste uh, is very low value. So just picking up the waste is not enough to cover the cost of transportation and you know, storage and all that stuff. Uh, so there's a fee for that, but it's like it's a nominal fee. It's like 20 bucks a year for once a month pickups. Uh, but now, when the war started, uh, we stopped uh, first because half of our uh, our staff was either going to be uh, taken to the front or uh, yeah, they were activated. What was happening? Uh, but uh, quickly, as soon as we stopped, I started this uh, this uh, fundraiser, and then we started using our cars and our resources to transport humanitarian aid to uh, displaced. Uh, refugees to people still back in Artsakh to uh, also to soldiers, uh, you know, just to soldier well-being stuff. Yeah, that's right. So for those of you who aren't aware, uh, I am one of the subscribers to Hikes Recycling Pickup Service. And I was a bit surprised that, you know, I had a box full of recycling and then I got a little SMS saying that um, the service was going to be um, uh, suspended sure. indefinitely. But it was pretty clear why. Definitely. Temporary. Well, for the duration of, you know, until we win, of course. Yes. Uh, but uh, I got to say, Hike, I mean, I've known you for quite a long time. Uh, and whenever I try to describe an Armenian to people, I just close my eyes and think of you. Aww. Of course, like when I do that, those people think it's weird that I just close my eyes and stand silent for a couple of minutes. But... Uh, I don't know what to say. I mean, like, you're the, I, I always tell people that you're, and yes, I do talk about you sometimes, but I always tell people that you're the kind of guy who can, uh, who could sell ice to the Inuit, you know? 
Oh, come on. No, that's not a good salesman. I mean, I've been in sales for six, 17, Jesus, 17 years. No, the good salesman is not the person who's going to sell ice to the Inuit. It's the guy that's going to sell him a heater because that's what he needs. So you got to... <laughs> come on. See that? That's right. I just egged you on and you just proved my point to everybody. Right. Uh, anyway, so... So you you uh, you suspended the service, but there was a very good reason. Uh, maybe you can uh, sure. enlighten us a bit about what you did on September 27th. For those who aren't aware, September 27th is the day the Azerbaijanis decided to uh, invade us. Uh, and just if nobody's aware, they're not doing a very good job at it so far. <laughs> Uh, well, honestly, when I found out that there's something like that happening, uh, first day I wasn't sure what to do, to be honest. Like, uh, my mom called. I promised her I'm not going to do anything rash, like go and enlist or something and we find out what's going on. Uh, but I did uh, go see uh, one of them places where you enlist. I always mess up the, the, the words, but yeah, uh, the, the next day. The commissariat. Yeah, the next day. And they basically... Um, they said, uh, sorry, buddy, uh, you're a Canadian citizen. If, if we need you, it's because we're, we're really in deep doo-doo and, you know, uh, then you can come and, you know, get your gun. But uh, uh, they, I said, okay, fine. What can I do? I speak French, English, Russian, Armenian, whatever. What can I maybe, like, work as something? They're like, nope, not yet. Uh, if we need you, we'll let you know. Okay, fine. What can I do? They said, look, if you can convince your Canadian friends to like donate to himnadam.org or even send you money uh, and then you do something with it here or, you know, share some stuff online, that's the extent of what you can do. So I had a little light bulb moment. I'm like, you know what? Okay, there's a huge amount of friends that I have and family that I have in, in Canada. And I'm thinking, okay, sure. If, if they trust me, if I somehow show uh, transparently that I am using their funds uh, as they are intended to be used. Maybe I can gather a few hundred dollars and, you know, feed a few families or buy some boots for a few soldiers, something. Um, soon enough, like first couple of days, uh, $2,000 had already accumulated and then it kept growing. And until uh, a few days ago, we reached 35,000 Canadian dollars from oh, around Jesus. 150 uh, separate donors, some who have donated multiple times. And I, I believe there's a reason for that. There's an approach that I have that is different than, uh, you know, Himnadram. Look, I trust Himnadram, but uh, there, there are some people, including myself, who like to see where the money went, like what it was spent on. And the problem with that is money is fungible or fungible. I've never known how to pronounce that. It's this... The fact that a dollar from one person or a dollar from uh, person B, how do you decide which one was spent first? So uh, I decided on the system where... Okay, they, they didn't teach that class at University of Ottawa, so don't worry about it. You know what? I didn't know that too. It's Markarit uh, from, from Fresno who, who, who taught me that word. So <laughs> the, basically the fact is we, we decided that we're going to go in a chronological fund-in, fund-out uh, system. So everybody who donates agrees to the system that you've donated, you know, at this time and the first money in is the first money that comes out. And so what that does is, you know, you're, you're in this spreadsheet, you see yourself in the spreadsheet, either anonymous or with your name, and you see the amount of money that you've donated, how much of it is in the Canadian bank account, how much of it I've been able to withdraw here, what are the fees that came out, etc. And uh, how much cat of, of that money is in my hands and what it was spent on. So we have like the receipts and the pictures of people that it went to. At first, it was super detailed because there wasn't a lot of money. But once it became bigger, we started. Um, basically, we decided to go, hey, let's feed a lot of people a little instead of a few people a lot. And so it became that we were feeding or getting food and supplies to around 500 people a day like 300 to 500 people a day. Uh, so um, it was a little harder to keep track, uh, but you know, all the receipts are there. We know exactly which uh, money was spent uh, on which purchases. Like we did uh, purchases of one, in one day of like a million 200 drum, for example. So, you know, in there somewhere is the money from person X 
that was spent and they can see that. And so when somebody can see what their money went towards, two things happen, in my opinion, I may be wrong, but two things seem to happen. First of all, there's an attachment created. You know, they see the person who got fed or who received clothes or who received medicine because of their donation. Uh, so there's this sense of, you know, closure to, uh, of, you know, when you put money into like a big fund, it's just like rolling there. You don't know exactly when it's spent or what it's spent on. But in this case, you know exactly. And the next thing that happens is you can actually see that your money's been spent. So that's it. The effect of your donation has been complete. So that's great. I mean, you know, it did what it did. But if you want to have more impact, then you do it again. And so that it makes it that people are more likely to donate multiple times. And uh, again, we, uh, which is good because more people will eat. Yeah, I agree. Uh, people you. being able to eat is generally considered good. <laughs> it is a good thing. Uh, but yeah, I think you bring up an important point. I mean, obviously, your angle here is the transparency aspect. And because you're a single person who is uh, handling every aspect of this operation from the uh, accepting the donations to... to there. Sorry, man, I have to interrupt. So I am not the person that's doing... All... I mean, maybe at first, but then uh, I met uh, the wife of a very, very good friend, Haik Hakopian who's in our team in Apaga. And this lady is honest to God, without her, none of this would have happened to the degree that when we registered our NGO, which is called the Transparent Charity NGO, she is the president. <laughs> I'm the Karkova, the secretary. So <laughs> she, she, like, without Anush, Anush Martirosan, for those who have, have not known her, this lady, like, she has... Well, thank you, Anush. Yes, thank you, Anush. Like, she's... Uh, She's awesome. Like now, unfortunately, she's sick, so she's been uh, not uh, like physically present. But even while she was sick, she was coordinating most of it. Like I, I would have been lost without Anur. So, and we have over ninety volunteers that have gone through our system. We have a core team of like ten volunteers that are there almost every day. Um, like all, all kinds of people, people that don't speak Armenian. We have Indian Armenians in our in our team. We have like the Lebanese Armenians. We have even Artsakhsi. So there's people who've received help from us that are like, hey, I want to also participate. We have Arshak, who's our IT, our CTO in, uh, in Apaga. His family uh, does um, sewing. So they actually got Artsakh, uh, Artsakhsi women to come and like sew uh, sleeping bags, uh, ponchos, uh, you know, all, like, like, there's a whole lot of people doing this. I, I'm just like, I, I'm just the, the guy that successfully got people to trust him to use their money uh, honorably that that's just that's me uh, well that's uh, great in that case let me rephrase <laughs> not so much you as an individual but you as a small group uh, obviously you can garner more trust because i mean uh correct me again if i'm wrong but initially a lot of the donations came from people that you personally knew yeah. right and so there's also this there's always this dichotomy when it comes in general to donating to Armenian uh, causes, because of course, a lot of people in the diaspora uh, don't have direct family, family links or personal ties with Armenia. And so they don't always know who the person on the ground is. So typically, and this is why, uh, you know, if you guys remember during the 2016 war, uh, a whole bunch of charities just kind of popped up asking people for money that they were supposedly going to give to the soldiers uh, or, uh, you know, to bring um, uh, su supplies to Artsakh and so on. Uh, most of them were absolutely legitimate. We're not sure about all of them, but either way, it created a coordination issue because nobody knew who was getting what kind of supplies. And this is why this time around, um, People have been asking, or at least the government of Armenia has been telling people to donate to two specific uh, charities, of course, so the uh, All Armenia Fund and the the uh, Insurance Fund for Armenian Soldiers. These are two charities that uh, are receiving the bulk of most people's donations. However, it's important to point out that sometimes the in specific um, and targeted actions 
by individuals can also be extremely important. And this is where small scale projects like yours make such a difference. I mean, how many people have you fed so far? So just us, like without the Swedish uh, NGO that joined us uh, a week and a half ago, um, we have fed over 6,500 people. Now, uh, for an average of a week, a week and a half worth of food. Yeah. And so how with the Swedish NGO, how many is that? Double that. So around 14,000. 14,000. So for reference, there are about 90,000 people from Arza who have been displaced by this war. So basically, uh, this organization has literally fed 14% of all of the population of, of the refugee population of Arza. That's, uh, that's amazing. I mean, can you... <laughs> like, can can the World Food Organization say they've done something like this? You know, I mean, this is a single organization that succeeded in doing that. Um, I remember you it's mentioning it's, it's not over yet. Like we still have, and it's not time. and it's not over. Unfortunately, this war goes on. We're on day thirty-one of this war now. But that's not what um, I meant. Uh, even if the war ends yesterday, uh, there's still months. Uh, of work left to do because yeah for sure uh, uh, and it's winter is coming soon a lot of people no longer have homes this no. isn't like they're going to be just skimping on back to their house in Stepanakert when this as soon as this is over I mean a lot of people need to eat they need to be uh, in shelter they need something to do um, to wait this out um, you mentioned what what kind of food do you get and where do you get it from so uh, that's my uh, wife, Mariam. Mariam, you could say hi to hello. 34 okay. people who are watching. <laughs> uh, okay. So the food, I don't want to say where we got it from because it would be an advertisement to that organization. But from a supermarket, like you're not getting it off a plane at the until, airport. Until the Swedish, uh, um, Swedish cooperation kicked in. It's a demand for action. Uh, name of the organization. It's an amazing place. Demandforaction.com. Um, until they, they kicked in, we were basically getting retail price stuff. So we spent like a whole lot of more money than we should have if that organization had given us discounts. Now, uh, with the help of uh, Vartan uh, Marashlan, he uh, got us in touch with another organization that what if we do start working with them or when we start working with them, I'll name them, uh, who have shown interest in giving us wholesale prices uh, or well, hopefully at least wholesale prices. Uh, but yeah, thus far as the supermarkets, stores, um, and what, what we do basically is we take our uh, Smart Tapaga Ford, old Ford, and we drive it to the supermarket, stuff it you know, with the guys. We go, uh, we, go we, we fill it up. We take it back to Anush's parents' place. They have this backyard where it all gets sorted. Uh, mostly girls do the sorting because they do it best. We tried as guys once and failed miserably. So uh, we, you know, how it's been done for 200,000 years, man. You, you know, guys go and kill the mammoth, bring it back, uh, the, the women <laughs> distribute so that everybody gets their fair share. Hopefully that's not considered sexist. Uh, but this is- Is there any mammoth on the menu for the refugees? No, unfortunately. But the idea is that we have this uh, process going and throughout the three weeks or four weeks now that we've been doing this. We've gotten progressively better at it until the point where, uh, you know, the, the Swedish uh, organization, so a demand for action kicked in. The demand for action went straight to the original store that we were doing and got uh, about $30,000 worth of food, uh, wholesale prices, uh, enough to feed 1400 Five person families, five person average families, so around 7,000, if my math is correct, people, which we finished distributing today. So there are currently 196 boxes left that are at the, um, what's Nagari Shneri Miyutun thing next to Kino Moskva. Uh, and uh, we have a list of uh, people who are going to come pick it up today and that they came pick up today and tomorrow as well. And that's, that's the end of that until the next fundraiser. They uh, are now working on sending uh, winter clothes 
three containers full of winter clothes from uh, from uh, Sweden uh, will arrive somewhere oh. on November 15th. That's around 50,000 uh, uh, jackets or whatever. Uh, and then in December, usually they have a gala, a fundraising gala, but because of coronavirus, they may not. Instead, they're looking at doing something else to raise another round of around 30 plus thousand dollars to continue this. So it's an ongoing process. We're still accepting donations. Uh, some have accumulated, so we have some money to now keep going until the next uh, demand for action uh, fund, fundraiser kicks in. And uh, how do you, uh, of course, I assume you're going to keep us, keep us appraised of this so that we know uh, when to, you know, boost the announcements uh, on our various social media platforms. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. I, I, always, I was worried for a second. It's our page. Like I, I put the, took the liberty to put our logo here. Uh, but there's our page. So Transparent Charity and your top on six body goals. It's a very recent page that uh, that I made just so that people can follow. Because I also like post a bunch of other stuff on my profile. It all started as Hikes fundraiser for displaced families. Uh, there's so that everyone, has a good ring to it. Yeah, uh, the uh, basically once you donate, you get a link to a Google Drive or a Google Sheet where your name appears and you follow uh, with where your money has went. That's the, the main difference of what we're doing. Now, Abstract is working on a website. We're calling it a donation management portal, where not only will donors be able to follow their money much more uh, specifically. Like you bought 10% of a bag, a 100 kilo bag of potatoes, for example. But you can also uh, democratically vote on what your money. That's obviously the donation from the Irish Armenians. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, I, I haven't received donations from Ireland, but I have from Barcelona, from uh, Russia, from Ukraine, from Latvia, from UAE, I believe. Uh, Canada, US, so there's a bunch of Armenians everywhere that I've met that uh, are sending donations. But what I wanted to say is that once you donate, when the website is up and running, when you donate, there's going to be a list of things that money can be spent on uh, in a given campaign. And you can basically put little ticks on things that you absolutely want your money to be spent on and things that you absolutely do not want your money to be spent on. And so once again, chronologically, it will go along. And then on the other side, there's going to be people who need the help who can also, you know, they call us and we have people that would put in their information and say at some point there's a lot of food. Maybe, you know, we don't, the, the people that need help don't need food help. Uh, so the proportion of what the money is spent on uh, becomes dynamic and changes with time. Uh, based on what people call and say, hey, I need clothes. My kids are cold. And so uh, more of the funds will go to clothes based on what the demand is. So it becomes a dynamic, uh, almost Adam Smithian kind of uh, platform where... You, you know, mean the invisible can... hand of the charity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, maybe we can rename our charity to that. But uh, yeah, and use a portrait of Adam Smith as your logo. Uh, also, just for all our 52 uh, watchers, uh, I've placed a link to Hike's page in the uh, wow. chat. Thank you. Yeah, it's called multitasking hike. Uh, so, uh, so okay. So I was my one of my questions was what's the future of this organization? But I think you've already explained it, and also you've made a really great advertisement for Ford trucks because you know what they say: Ford built Artsakh tough. No, but okay. or I don't know. I, I I never really watched the advertisements. The the future, like if I were to add to that, would be not just uh, humanitarian aid, uh, but well, of course, humanitarian aid, but also to rebuild things. So. Later on, you know, maybe uh, years from now, when most of the stuff is back to normal, hopefully, um, you know, teaching kids things, skills like it, it, it's um, it can become pretty malleable in the sense that you, our our main focus is the transparency of the uh, donation tracking. So, with that, we can open multiple different campaigns, uh, and you know, based on each campaign, again, divide it up on things that the money can be spent on, and people can donate and donate to specific campaigns. 
that's the future. Uh, so, can we talk about well, here's a question from uh, Rima. Yeah, I'm just going to name drop her. Um, tell us a bit about your own experience. You know, I mean, whereas I mentioned earlier, we're 31 days into this, uh, this little experience. Uh, you weren't here in 2016, right? No. So this is probably, well, this must be your second war since you... Yeah, I was I was here during the, but I was a kid. I was like I was very small. I was five six. But I remember looking out the window and seeing stuff being blown up very far away. I don't know why. Maybe it was a thunderstorm. I was really small, so I, I don't take my word for it. But uh, my experience with war, I don't have any experience with war. I once went to a Canadian recruiting place to find out, well, you know, what the what would I wanted to be a sniper, and they're like, uh -uh, nope, too short. So they're like, yeah, it's heavy equipment and you got to like, it's long equipment. So yeah, no, uh, I mean, it's not impossible, but highly unlikely. They're like, if you join, you'd probably be stuck in a small tank. So I didn't. <laughs> and, uh, but my experience with the war so far is that I have friends, uh, you know, who have lost uh, people uh, in this war, in past wars. Um, and I've seen... It's it's really heartbreaking actually when you go see some families and they're like living in a basement, you know, 18 people, um, no sleeping bags uh, on a cement floor. Like that's that sucks. And the but the, the most touching thing was when uh, Hike Anush's uh, husband told how they went to see a family and he hadn't even put down the the supplies on the floor. And this little kid just ran up and hugged him, like just hugged him as a stranger. And like the other kids just took the stuff and they went to the kitchen and started looking through it because they either had not eaten for the last like few days or had eaten like plain rice or something or just like pasta. Uh, and I, there's been some um, painful moments. Uh, one of them was in Bajni when a guy said, um, so how much of this have you guys eaten uh, so to, to give us the crumbs that you've brought? Like, you know, as if, uh, you know, we've been somehow corrupt and we, anyways, that, that. Unfortunately, uh, that's an Armenian trait. Just, just as, just as, you know, coming together at times of existential crisis and immense heroism and all those things are, quintessentially Armenian characteristics sometimes you know this uh, this self-doubting um, nihilistic approach is also typically Armenian yeah I there's got always it. the one guy there was always that one guy there's it always is. the one guy at every Armenian event there's always the one who has to say that <laughs> there's some questions coming in man we don't have a lot of time maybe we should talk we'll all right let's let's move on to the questions um uh, so we've got 43 people watching this i expect every single one of you to ask an original and different question which hike will answer in full detail uh -huh. let's start this one with david alexandrian who asks what are the specific needs in terms of human resources what assignments are given to your volunteers oh easy one so drivers uh, loaders, uh, um, sorters, callers. So callers are the people who call to find out if somebody actually needs. They do a, um, they vet them basically as much as possible. Uh, packers are the ones, you know, sorters, sorry, same thing as packers, are the ones who pack these individual boxes and bags. Uh, drivers are the ones who have cars who are willing to volunteer to drive the things to their destinations. And uh, what was the other one? I forget. Uh, sorters. No, I said sorters. But anyways, I, I think they're pretty self -explanatory. Unloaders. Loaders, yeah. So guys who will uh, may not have cars, but will are willing to you know load somebody else's car. Right. So just to just to be clear, the loaders should also be capable of unloading. Yes. <laughs> All right. Because you don't want to get like two different guys. You know, one guy loads, one guy unloads. 
But Hayek, I mean, it sounds like you're running your very own Teamsters union here. Like, <laughs> you got the trucks, you got the the, the workers. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next question. Uh, by Maria Chobanyan. Mariana Chobanyan, I'm sorry. Hayek Chan, are you going to continue uh, both working for Abaga and the Transparency Charity in the future? Um, so... No, good, very good question. So my I'm, work, I'm sure Mariana doesn't sound like this when she talks, but you know. Uh, so my whole thing is that uh, right now, uh, Smart Tabaga does rely a lot on my work because I'm the one who does the, I'm the secretary basically that does the calls and does the dispatching and all that stuff. But that is soon going to be replaced by an application and uh, Ashak is working on that. So my uh, work will be much lighter. And uh, thanks to Anush, uh, I, I don't have to organize things. So right now, uh, I'm basically working as muscle uh, to some degree, but uh, also like posting some... That's um, how desperate the situation is, you guys. <laughs> shut up. But... <laughs> No, I mean, I, I've seen Hike load like, a, you know, a 50 pound, 50 pound box. I mean, he's a, he may be small, but he's a beast. It, it grow, makes the hair grow on the chest. Um, anyway. uh, God knows you don't need any more of that. No, I don't. Uh, but yes, I, I will be doing both. And I mean, I, I'm doing like five things already. I'm also project. I, I, I'm able to delegate tasks to other people and do the ones that I need to do, the ones that are vital. And so one more is not going to make uh, much of a difference. All right. So important question, when do you sleep? Or are you kind of like Batman where you just kind of you know, like recuperate in a cave? I, I sleep uh, <laughs> two, two and a half hour uh, blocks, uh, REM cycles. So I'll sleep at like midnight and I'll wake up at five with one wake up in between. This is my, this has been the case for over 10 years now. Okay. So you're kind of like Napoleon. Um, yeah, like li literally you have the same sleep schedule as Napoleon. I hope you know that. Okay. No, you're also probably taller than Napoleon. No, he's taller than me. I've checked. <laughs> you checked. Of course you did. <laughs> I'm as tall as that. Uh, uh, that is, th is this your mom, Victoria Chituni? Chituni? Is, yeah, I knew it. But if it says, uh, <laughs> your mom says, thank you for a bit of a laugh today. I don't know if that's directed at you or me because your work isn't really, you know, funny. It's just really amazing. Probably now, you with your jokes, your Irish jokes. Okay. Now, Elina says, thank you, Hike. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I guess I guess the my the performance question? wasn't good enough, but that's okay. And of course, Pascal is asking you how many families do you aim to help on a weekly basis, and how uh, what can people far away do to help you? Actually, Pascal, that's an excellent question. I honestly wish I had thought of asking this because. Yeah, it kind of sounds like an obvious question. How do people help you? Obviously, you mentioned, um, you know, asking people to to lift boxes and sort and make phone calls. But there's a lot of people on this uh, call right now who are all over the world. And uh, you know as well as I do that we, we here living in Armenia or Artsakh who are a bit more active in this physically active uh, in this conflict, we get messages every day by people asking us what, what they can do. And often our answer is donate and advocate. Uh, but what else can they do to help your particular project? Um, well, one example I can give you is Markari, the one who taught me about the word fungible or fungible, I still don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, so she did a raffle. So she bought uh, um, at first some uh, golden pomegranate thing from a very famous golden pomegranate maker, apparently, and uh, did a raffle. So she spent maybe like 80 bucks on it or 40 bucks on it. And she raised money with people. And this applies to like non-Armenians, right? So everybody likes raffles. So she would be like, hey, you know, by Friday, uh, whatever, you know, we collect, one person uh, wins that pomegranate based on how much they put. So every five bucks gets you a ticket or something. Now, one of her friends donated an espresso machine 
and she's uh, raised over, I believe, eight hundred dollars with raffle tickets. Uh, so that, I think that's a great idea. Um, but in my case, that's one thing the Artsakhs need, Artsakh people need, is a good shot of espresso in the morning. Just kidding. I know that's not what I, what I, what is actually happening. I understand the concept of raffles. Right. So that that was a very cool idea. But mo most of what is needed is to keep the funding coming. Uh, so as it comes, we spend it. So when we spend and it's over, then you know we can't do anymore. Uh, but what people can do is, uh, yeah, share. I mean, it's the same thing: share and donate, share and donate. But uh, to answer Pascal's question of how many we aim to help as many as we can. So our, we, we, pla um, uh, we pla not plateaued, we peaked. We peaked, <laughs> oh, hello, hello. Uh, we peaked at uh, 3,100 yeah. families, not families, individuals in one day. This was when we delivered 500 uh, or 600 something packages on Saturday. Uh, that was a, that was a crazy day. Um, so that was our peak. So we can't do that every day. Uh, but our peak without the funding from uh, Demand for Action uh, was around 500 uh, individuals a day. <laughs> uh, actually, that's a perfect... Susia. Okay, that's a perfect segue into Elina Danielian's question. <laughs> which was about the long-term sustainability. What do you want, Maran? Yelag. There's no yelags here. Okay, take this, go. So uh, she said, she's asking if sending boxes is sustainable in the long-term for how many months can you keep doing that? And would it be useful to have cash assistance projects like it's done in other countries? And then I remember, and uh, maybe to tie into that question because uh, in the last conversation uh, we had, you mentioned that a lot of what you're doing is just sort of you're, uh, you know, holding up the fort until the government social assistance programs can catch up with the, you know, the ongoing refugee crisis. All right. Thank you, Marad. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so basically to answer that, um, I actually really, really wanted to uh, give cash as well. And we have on several occasions. So there's like uh, for, for bread or something. And there was this one lady in Noem Benyan, this old lady who was living basically in a trailer, uh, a small trailer. And uh, uh, she basically... Um, um, she was feeding or helping feed like most of the people that were that were there. So I, I you know, I, I just gave her forty thousand down. Uh, but um, giving cash. So the thing is that in order to get people to see where their money goes, they have to see the pictures. And I can't like it. It makes more sense to take pictures of uh, bringing like supplies uh, rather than. And you can't take a picture of handing cash to someone. It's or if somebody has an idea on how to do that in a proper way, like it. Have you asked Gagik Tsarukian? I think he's an expert. <laughs> I don't know. But um, yes, you can. So uh, one of the things that we want to do in the future is to, is to enable people to sponsor families. So somebody will eventually be able to like sponsor a family through our platform and be able to send donations to them directly if they want. So this is something in the future. But right now, it's an emergency situation. So being sustainable is not in like a priority right now. We're just trying to do as much as we can with what we get until the emergency situation is passed. And then afterwards, figure out more sustainable or, or figure out the sustainability issue later. Uh, and how, how are you coordinating this with the government? Uh, so before we started uh, the, um, well, not before we started. So during, I did meet with the uh, Ministry of Defense. Uh, I won't name the person, but uh, an individual from the Ministry of Defense who takes care of like uh, keeping track of who went where. We, um, we coordinate this last uh, thing that we did. We coordinated with the provinces. Is it provinces or states? Anyways, with the Marspet, the Marses. Uh, yeah, the Marspet. provinces. Yeah, uh, with the Bureau Beds, with the 
uh, you know, how Minecraft is and all that stuff. Uh, we we basically coordinate with them. They have lists of people that they know who have registered. And please, any Artsakhs who is watching this, please go register. There's so many people that don't register in their municipality, either because they don't know or, I don't know, probably just because they don't know. But please, 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 whoever speaks with anybody who is a refugee, make sure they register. Because if they don't register, we can't know that they need help. Yeah, unfortunately, that's also a very common thing amongst Armenians where people just, you know, they go like, but no, nobody did anything to help me. And then, How you know, you? the answer is like, but we didn't know you existed. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's very bad. Like, you have to register. All right, let's see if we have any more questions here. I'm not seeing any. Guys, there's 49 people who are live here. What's going on? So how do you give your assistance envelope or bank accounts as a transparency? Oh yeah, you can ask that one. Your signature. Yes. Uh, so, Elena, John, the, the idea is that posting, like that's something I could post, you know, with redacted names and stuff like that, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't get the emotional response maybe. Uh, like there's something that happens when you see like a kid standing next to the stuff that they that they've received or like you know uh, somebody making a video saying thank you or things like that that have this emotional impact that make people want to do more um so we have put cash in envelopes and handed them you know five or ten bucks here ten bucks there because we don't deliver bread for example bread is super cheap in Armenia, and like ten bucks can go a long way on bread so like i said we're uh, in order to make sure that uh, we are helping the humanitarian in a humanitarian way, so far the most uh, efficient or effective way has been to actually deliver the food to them. Some of these people are in villages very, very far away. And so, uh, you know, just oh, different. And some of the places that we take food to are centralized locations, like um, a hotel, for example. So a hotel may have hundreds of people staying there. So we wouldn't spend the whole day delivering, you know, handing out envelopes of, uh, of cash because we'd have to hand it to them directly. I, I would not trust cash to, let's say, the clerk at a hotel to go and deliver it. Maybe, you know, I don't know. So when we take, uh, you know, 50 kilograms or actually more than 500 kilos of potatoes to uh, a, a hotel, well, obviously they're not going to pocket the potatoes. They're going to cook with it and, and serve it. So so far, the safest, most transparent way that we've been able to do this is uh, through buying food. And transparency is also important because I could just take a picture of an empty envelope handing it to somebody and, it, and say that there's 20,000 thumb in it, but in fact, there's only 2,000 thumb in it. So it, it wouldn't convey as much honesty as having receipts of things purchased with the amount of it and having them delivered. Okay, so I've got a question now from my cousin, uh, Ari, who says, uh, he apologizes if this question has already been addressed, but he wants, you to, he wants to know if you cooperate with the Armenia Fund uh, and what is your view on donating to Armenia Fund versus your own organization? Uh, also, he says hi to me, Mariam and Maral, who were all uh, featured on this program, not by choice. <laughs> So but please uh, go ahead. do not uh, cooperate with Armenia Fund. Honestly, I wouldn't know how to cooperate with Armenia Fund. I know that in the future, once we have our website, there is going to be a tick where it says that we can redonate it to Armenia Fund. Uh, but uh, the main difference is, I believe, and I, I, I don't really know because I donated, but uh, I, I don't know where that money went. So there are some people who categorically do not want their money to be spent on weapons, for example. So I don't know if Armenia funds spend money on weapons. Uh, people don't know if they spend money on weapons. Or there are some people who may categorically not want their money to be spent on food. Who knows? So, um, so you can't choose that when you donate to Armenia Fund. You, you donate, and they do with it what they think is right. And I have no doubt that they do with it what is right. Uh, in my case, what I made was mainly for those who are skeptical or who rather, maybe not even skeptical, but just who would rather see exactly where their money went. 
and this is um, you know it, it's it's a thing that uh, I find that it's important uh, if somebody wants to see where their money went they can see where their money went and uh, most of the people who have donated to me also have donated to the Armenia uh, fund so there's, it's not a or or uh, it can be and and or uh, I really don't mind as long as people donate somewhere um, I'm okay with that Hello, somebody there? That's right, it's, it's important. Yeah, I can. We got a little, okay. Yes, I can hear you. All right, uh, is, I guess to our viewers, it's important to uh, clarify that this doesn't have to be all an either or. Uh, you can do both. You can donate to Armenian Fund, you can donate to these specific projects like Hi. In fact, I encourage you to do that because ultimately as one of our commentators here said i think it was pascal uh, all armenia fund is uh, a much more larger type of impact it's more about uh rebuilding the roads and the houses um and rebuilding all that infrastructure and art stuff that the azeris uh are of course trying deliberately to destroy because of course for them the goal is to make it uninhabitable so when you're uh, donating to armenia fund uh, what you're doing is you're helping make Artsakh a home for Armenian people. Uh, but projects like hikes, of course, are more about very targeted and specific uh, needs that are much more urgent. So if you can do both, do that. If you can do one or the other, do that. Uh, but certainly there's nobody in Armenia who's going to say, no, you've already given us too much money. Please stop. Hey, maybe I should mention how to donate. Does, does that make sense? Yes, that's a better point. You should probably tell people how they can help you. I've already shared a link to your charity's Facebook group on our chat. In fact, I will do it one more time. Um, so uh, to donate uh, from Canada, currently, because we're still in the process of opening an account here, it's through an e-transfer, Interact e-transfer. So it's uh, transparent charity NGO at gmail.com. You can just e-transfer money there. When you do, you have to contact me directly via Facebook or something else uh, so that I can give you a link to the spreadsheet where you'll see and be able to follow your money. So in Canada, it's Interact e-transfers. Anywhere else, it's PayPal. So it's paypal.me slash strong A R T. S A K H strong. Um, and uh, we, once we open our account here, uh, then people will be able to also donate directly to our account in Armenia. For people who donate from Armenia, it's currently it's going through my personal account. I mean, this all started as a personal fundraiser, so it all went through me. Unfortunately, there's been some losses in fees and in uh, uh, what's it called? Um, currency exchange so that that's kind of sucks but we're working on fixing that uh but uh, yeah if you want if you want to donate you can just contact me directly on facebook i'll give you the instructions on how to do that and give you the link of where you can follow your money all right so we'll take this one last question are we this because Andrew asks, what's that? Sorry, uh, it's getting, it's lagging. So yeah, next question, yeah. Uh, so Gayane Hakopian says that she is working with a team of uh, psychologists and they're working with children from Artsakh who obviously uh, are probably suffering from various traumas. Uh, do you know how you can put her in contact with uh, families who may need uh, psychological help or workshops for mental health? Um, I know of one place where we bought some putty, like clay. And so the kids from our stuff were like making stuff out of that clay. Uh, the, um, uh, my counterpart, I don't know if that's the right term, uh, my colleague, uh, Luisa Consta, uh, she has an NGO also who helps kids uh, with this uh, distress stuff. So she also is looking for them. We went to a few kindergartens. I, I honestly, I don't know who to give the, the contact of, of like kids who need help. 
we've been and a lot of people ask us also if we know shelters and places where people can go live we don't but we've been really focusing on clothes uh, food medicine uh, hygiene products and uh, a small percentage also goes to the well-being of soldiers so again the same stuff but for soldiers like we've purchased a lot of boots we've sewn a lot of uh, sleeping bags and ponchos and things like that uh, but in terms of like uh, psychological help um, or uh, you know just uh, like housing uh, we're not doing that unfortunately not yet anyways okay so i also for those who were asking i added your paypal uh link as well as the charity to make it easier for people to send you some money here i'll, I'll post um, this is where you can e-transfer stuff if you're in canada canada yay okay well um you know i think that uh I'm actually surprised that uh, we've had so much uh, watching retention uh, this far into the video. Obviously, we're doing a great job, and I didn't say the F word even one time during this whole uh, live. I know. We should uh, applaud each other for it. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, Hike, thank you so much for taking this time with us. Thanks to uh, me. Obviously, every minute you spend talking to me is one minute that you're not helping people in Artsakh. So I'm going to let you get back to your Napoleonic sleep schedule and, um, you know, continue what you do. Uh, <laughs> formidable, yeah. Yeah, for That's formidable, right. exactly. So... Um, you know, and for everybody who's been watching, all 26 people, that's right, that's half of the people who started out, but still not bad. Um, you now you know where to donate, you know um, how to follow and how to help. Uh, please spread the word. Let your friends know what this is all about, because as Haik has uh, explained quite clearly, this is an emergency situation that he's active, he and his group have activated to uh, help alleviate. So thank you to everybody for tuning into our our call tonight. Um, thank you, Repat Armenia. I now have to read a book to my daughter. So uh, and yes, thank you, Repat Armenia, for hosting this. This was a great idea. Thanks. Uh, have a great night, and Hike, thanks so much for being on the show, on the, the show. Rafi show. <laughs> All right, bye, Rafi. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, bye. Ciao.